Welcome everybody to the Ontario Science Students Association's eighth and final lecture of our inaugural lecture series. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Jeffrey Rao to help, up, help us wrap up this series. So Dr. Rao is an assistant professor at the University of Windsor focusing on theoretical condensed matter physics. Most of his research falls under the broad heading of quantum magnetism with some excursions into strongly correlated systems more generally. Recently, Dr. Rao has been focusing on various realizations of frustrated magnets with strong anisotropy, uh, such, as, uh, such as those found in rare earth and heavy uh, transition metal magnets. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand things over to Dr. Rao. All right, so thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you for the, the, those of you who have uh, shown up to, to listen to my talk. Um, I'm not a stranger to small audiences, so this doesn't bother me too much. Just think that you, you know, uh, you'll be the ones that'll actually get to hear it. Um, okay, uh, I decided to, to talk to you today about a topic that's, that's quite broad. Um, so I sort of gave it this title, order, disorder, and order by disorder. Um, and so because I know this audience is, is not necessarily as, you know, the, the, this group um, doesn't contain that many physicists, I tried to make this as accessible as possible to those without too much physics background. Um, and so I'm going to start by, there it goes, by sort of trying to ask and answer three questions. So if we're going to talk about order and disorder and order by disorder, we should talk first about what we mean by order. Um, what we mean by order, not just in the colloquial sense, but in sort of the technical physics sense. Um, what we mean by disorder, you know, not just the opposite of order, it can be, be more precise than that. Um, and then once we have those two things, you know, at least partially understood, at least partially defined, um, then we're going to try to answer this question. Um, how can disorder actually lead to order, which at least in terms of the vocabulary feels a bit backwards, right? Um, and so these two topics here will be very, uh, very broad. This one here will be a little more specific and will connect to some uh, current research that, that I am in particular interested in. Okay, so let's look at this first question. What is order, right? And sort of colloquially, when you think of the word order, you, you, know, you think of things that have a lot of structure, something that's regular, something that's not random, right? Um, and so I put up some examples here of things that I would consider to be very ordered. Um, you know, I'm a condensed matter physicist. I think a lot about materials. And so when I think of order, I, I immediately jump to crystals. Um, and so here you have this beautiful crystal of pyrite, um, beautiful crystal of, of, of ordinary table salt. Um, you know, who doesn't like pictures of snowflakes? Um, and even crystals of more complicated organic molecules like insulin uh, can be grown. And so these all have some structure, some regularity to them that would make me call these things ordered in some sense, right? But really at that point, am I just, you know, acting like a thesaurus and just changing the word order to some other synonym, right? And it's not clear what precisely I mean by that, right? So all of these things clearly have some pattern, some structure to them, these clean facets, these sort of in intricate patterns to their growth. But with that definition, it's not still clear what exactly we mean by that, right? And so to understand why we consider these things ordered, why they have this structure, we're going to look a little more carefully at the underlying physics of these materials. Um, before we do that, I just want to show you this fun picture that I found when I was Googling uh, pictures of crystals uh, for that slide, which is uh, an incredible cave in uh, Mexico that was opened up about 20 years ago um, that has crystals uh, that are three, four meters in length, weighing several hundred pounds. So normally when you think of a crystal, you picture things like this, maybe they're on a table, maybe they're you know little tiny bits in your salt shaker, not necessarily true. They can be quite, quite large, even um, when naturally occurring. Unfortunately, that cave is now flooded again and is no longer accessible. Um, even when it was accessible, it was about 58 degrees Celsius in there, so it wasn't exactly pleasant, but they did get this nice picture. Okay, so where's the structure coming from? Where is the source of it all? So this comes from the underlying regularity of the atoms in the crystal. So if we look at something like quartz, you know, you can't really see the atoms in a, a, in a sample of quartz that you can see with your eye. But if we imagine making a, a very small bit of quartz where you know, the, the size of the crystal was comparable to the size of the atoms, it might look something like this. Um, and if we cut this thing down the middle and looked at a cross section, um, what you could see was that the, the silicon and oxygen that make up this quartz crystal uh, form a regular repeating structure. 
And so if you can see here, if you stare at it carefully, for example, this silicon atom here and this silicon atom here have the same environment around them. Everything around them looks the same. Okay, so this underlying regularity is what's behind this structure we're seeing in the crystals. And uh, just so I don't take credit for something I didn't do, I did not make these pictures. There's an incredible web page up here that is just entirely about quartz and it has hundreds of renderings of crystals and atoms just like this if you're, if you're interested, if you like that kind of thing. Um, so if we were to look at this uh, a little more carefully, but actually you know, make this a little more precise, which is if I took that, that, that sort of plane of silicon and oxygen um, in the quartz crystal and I sort of carefully drew uh, a region like this, what you could see is if I sort of tiled this region in the plane, um, everything in this box repeats perfectly from place to place, right? Everything in this region here is reproduced in this region here, is reproduced in this region here, is reproduced in this region here. So these crystals are made up of sort of repeating units, repeating unit cells um, that are identical across the whole crystal, okay? And so this is sort of the underlying regularity, the underlying structure um, that gives rise to this, you know, more qualitative features that we saw in the, the sort of macroscopic crystals themselves. And so this is not something that's limited to atomic, atomic arrangements, right? You could imagine, um, instead of thinking about a crystal itself, we could think about something um, like a magnet. So this would, you know, be a very bit of a strange fridge magnet, but you could, you know, take a, a, a something like a fridge magnet, um, which is ferromagnetic, and you could ask, is there some kind of order there, some kind of regularity, right? You know, it's less obvious here what's regular in this in this horseshoe, but if we imagine looking closely at the atoms, so here this would be some crystal in itself, right? And so the atoms here would be arranged in some regular pattern, but that's not what gives rise to this this magnetism. Um, here, each of the atoms in this uh, this magnet sort of behave like little bar magnets themselves. So this is a property of of electrons which transfers to the atom. They carry spin. They behave like little magnets. Um, and so what happens in this ferromagnet um, is that uh, these little bar magnets, the, the spin of the electrons, actually all point in the same direction. Okay, so if you were going to sort of zoom in on this, this cartoon with these arrows are telling you which way that electron spin is pointing. And then if you know this one's pointing up, the next one's also pointing up, the next one's also pointing up, they're all aligned. And because they're all aligned, all of their magnetism in some sense adds up, right? Because it's all adding up, it becomes large. Right? You're adding up the, the mag magnetic field, the magnetism of each one of these atoms. It gives you this strong magnetic field that lets you stick things to your fridge. Okay, And so this has some regularity, some structure of its own, some order of its own that's not that's in some sense independent from the order in its crystal structure. So this is not always obvious. So you know the ferromagnet, you know something kind of special is happening that you can stick it to things, but there are other materials where it's not not so clear. So, this is a material called yttrium barium copper oxide. Um, don't worry too much about that chemical formula. If you were just to hold it, um, it just looks like kind of a flaky silver gray material. Um, it doesn't look like it's doing much. Um, if you were to dip it in liquid nitrogen, it becomes a really interesting high temperature superconductor, but let's imagine we don't do that. We're just holding it at room temperature. Um, you could say, well, is there any kind of regularity there? On the face of it, you can't see anything. There's no magnetism. There's no nice structure to it. But if you were to look at the atomic scale, there actually is. Um, and so just like those um, electron spins, those little bar magnets in the atoms in the ferromagnet, each one of the atoms in this material has its own sort of direction. Um, but instead of lining up, these things prefer to anti-align. Okay, And so instead of forming one uniform direction for all these different uh, magnetic moments, they actually alternate so that the neighbors here and here are pointing in opposite directions. These neighbors are pointing in opposite directions. These neighbors are pointing in opposite directions, right? So it's not the same kind of pattern we saw before, but it's still a pattern, right? There's still some kind of structure there, okay? So it's a lot harder to notice because instead of adding up, the magnetic fields from each of these atoms cancel. You can't stick it to anything, but it's still uh, happening sort of deep inside the material. Okay, so that, those are some examples. How do we define this properly? And so let me give you a bit of a probably too precise definition and then we'll unpack it a bit. So what do we mean by order in physics, right? And so the definition I'm gonna use is a system has order. And if you want to be technical, I'd call it long range order. If you have some observable property of the system that is correlated even at very uh, long distance, even at very distant locations, okay? And so what do I mean by this? Well, a local observable property 
just means some physical thing that I can measure in one place, right? And so for those crystals, that'd be the location of an atom. Um, for these magnets, this would be direction of the spin. Is it up? Is it down? Is it pointing to the left or pointing to the right? That's our local property. You could define more and more of them so long as it's at some point in space. Um, we, can, we can lump it into that category. By correlated, we mean that the value at one point um, tells us something at the value at the other point. Right? Two things that are perfectly correlated um, will match. They might, maybe they are aligned, maybe they anti-align, but one, the, the, the value of one of these things tells us the value of the other thing. Okay? And then a distant, distant location typically means many, many, atom, many, many atomic spaces, uh, spacings apart. So it's not just correlated three atoms over, two atoms over, five atoms over, 100 atoms over, but it's correlated 1,000 atoms over, a million atoms over. Okay? So this is how we define order. Some regularity, um, some correlation in these local observables that persists to very, very, very long distances. OK, so let's just unpack that a little bit. If we look at this ferromagnet, if I tell you it's a ferromagnet, all these spins are aligned, right? If I pick out one of these spins here, I know that if they're aligned, this spin here will also be pointing in this direction. This spin here will also be pointing in this direction. If I go far and further and farther away, I can tell you this spin here is also pointing in this direction. So if I tell you the spin in one place, you can tell me the spin in the other place, right? And if it's all perfectly aligned, I can go as far as I want away and I still know something about what direction these spins are pointing, right? And so for this anti, this, this, this other case where they're, they're not aligned, but anti-aligned, and so this is called an anti-ferromagnet, um, it's basically the same idea. You just have to remember that as you step through this thing, you just have to sort of flip-flop from up to down as you go, right? So if I know this thing is up, I know its neighbor is down. I know the next one is up. I know the next one is down. And I can keep going as far as I want and still know something about which direction the spin should be pointing if I have this pattern, right? Um, the, same, the same kind of picture applies for these crystals. If I take a crystal like this, which is kind of a caricature of, of graphene, um, a two-dimensional sheet of carbon. Um, and if I tell you where some of the atoms are over here, if it's forming this perfect uh, ordered structure, and if I go further and further away, the locations of these atoms will fix perfectly the locations of these atoms, right? You just have to fix one or two atoms over here, and then the rest of the crystal is, is, has to fall together under that. Okay? So that's what we mean by order. So why do we find this out in the world, right? Um, so this is a bit of a complicated question. I'm gonna give you sort of a half answer to it. Um, really, there's not uh, as good of an answer as I would like. That's sometimes just the way it goes. Um, basically, what's happening here is at low temperatures, if the system is cold enough, as you cool it down, systems will tend to go into states where their energies are as low as possible. So if you think of something, you know, putting something cold against something to cool it down, you can kind of think of it as sort of pulling energy out of the system, right? And if you keep pulling energy out of the system, if you keep lowering its energy, it's gonna end up in whatever the lowest energy configuration it can be in, right? If you just keep lowering something, eventually it's gonna hit its minimum. Um, so we wanna be in a state that has as low as an energy as possible. Secondly, the interactions between these, these atoms or these spins or whatever they are can be quite symmetric. You know, the laws of nature usually have, have reasonably high symmetry. They don't care about um, orientations. They don't care about where you are. They don't care about, you know, um, whether you reverse the, the, the origin in space, whether you pick a left-handed coordinate system or a right-handed coordinate system, right? All these symmetry means will simplify these interactions um, and will prevent some pathological, pathological behavior um, in minimizing this energy. Um, and so this usually leads to only a handful of ways for these systems to actually find a state with the lowest possible energies. I put an asterisk there because it's not always true. There are exceptions to this and they generally fall under the the heading of frustrated systems, um, where despite these constraints, there are many, many, many ways to find uh, many, many, many different minimum energy states. Okay, for, for this talk, I'm mostly going to avoid this, um, or we'll see actually sort of close to the end, I'm giving you sort of a, we're just sort of dipping our toes in that water a little bit, um, but this is a whole other uh, uh, field in itself, um, one that um, I also uh, uh, work in. Okay, so practically, how does this go? Let's think about our crystals. Um, and so a very simple model for how atoms get built up into a crystal um, can be found in this famous quote um, from Richard Feynman. Um, this was, he was asked essentially, if I had to send 
one bit of information into the past or after a societal collapse to rebuild science, what would it be? And his answer was this sentence here, um, which is basically that everything's made of atoms and atoms are moving around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they're a little distance apart, but repelling each other when they're squeezed into one another. So that basically contains a whole lot of physics and that can help us understand uh, what these minimum energy states look like, right? So if I took say an atom here that had some interaction with other atoms that looked something like this, um, then what would happen if I added a second atom? Well, I've got this first atom here. We know this one wants to get closer. Once I get it close enough, it'll attract, but I can't get it too close because then it'll start repelling again, right? So it finds some nice distance where it's happiest, okay? So this is usually modeled by some sort of potential energy, um, depending on the distance between these atoms. So here, when they're very close together, it costs a whole lot of energy to put them close together. When they're far apart, they don't care about each other. But if you get them just the right distance, you can gain a little bit of energy, which is what they like, which is what they prefer, at least as you cool them down. Okay, so it wants to find this place just at this optimal distance. Okay, now we add another one. Well, I wanted to get as close as possible to these two, right? And so at the same time, that means putting it over here, same distance, but now I can get energy from both of those atoms and you can keep building it up that way, right? So I put one here, make this little triangle. Um, where do I put the next one? I've got a few choices on the edges, but as I keep going, hopefully you can see you're building up something like a crystal, right? As I keep going, I'm building up a regular array of these atoms that is repeating um, in this kind of triangular motif. The same kind of picture would apply to these magnets. So if I started with one of these, these spins, one of these magnetic moments, if it was like a ferromagnet and wanted to align, its, its neighboring spin would just go in the same direction. The next neighboring spin would just go in the same direction. And then eventually this could build up to, they're all pointing in the same direction, right? For something like this anti-ferromagnet where it wants to anti-align, same kind of pattern. You start with one of these spins in one direction. Its neighbor wants to go opposite to it. The next one can go opposite to it in any of the other directions. And then as you build this up, you'll get this alternating kind of checkerboard pattern um, that we saw in the cartoon there for the, the YBCO crystal. Okay, so this is what I mean by disorder. Oh, sorry, by order. <laughs> two, that, those are the two words I absolutely shouldn't, shouldn't swap here. This is what I mean by order. Okay, so um, the correlations at long distances between local properties um, in these systems. All right, so then what do I mean by disorder, right? If I know what order is, we should know what disorder is. So sort of the, the obvious answer would just be, can't we just say that disorder is whatever order isn't, right? If order is correlation at long distances, then is, isn't disorder a lack thereof, right? And so here, again, we've made this sort of little triangular crystal of these blue atoms, right? If I know where this one is, by the regularity of this pattern, I can tell you if I go over here where one over here is going to be, it's gonna be somewhere on this triangular uh, grid. Um, I'm saying, well, if they're saying you're not correlated, then I'm saying if I, well, if I know where this one is, I have no idea where the ones are over here, right? They're not forming some regular pattern, right? And here, so I've just taken this and sort of perturbed them a bit. So they're kind of randomly positioned. Some of them are too close together. Some of them are too far apart. They're not forming, it, forming any precise structure, okay? So it's not a bad definition. You know, disorder should be the opposite of order, but uh, we're going to want to be a little more precise than that um, in how we define what we mean by a disordered, what, what we mean by disorder in one of these systems. Um, and so one thing uh, that becomes clear if you start ask if you start looking at these kind of disordered like states, these superficially disordered states, is they look really similar, right? I just made some perturbations to these atoms, these red atoms over here to make them look less ordered in this, but I've got a lot of different ways I could have done that, right? To my eye, at least, all of these look roughly equally disordered, right? They don't look qualitatively different. If you know, you show me these four and put them away and ask me which one was the second one, I'd have no idea, right? They are different, but at least the broad features don't really change between them. So qualitatively, um, uh, these disordered states aren't really distinguishable by eye, right? Even though we've moved lots of atoms and they are different, they don't really look different, right? And so whatever macroscopic 
collective properties these atoms were seeing um, doesn't really change between these disordered states, right? So this is not something that's shared between the ordered states, right? You know, if I say, well, what, what can I do with these ordered states? Well, at best, I can sort of shift them around or rotate them, right? I've translated them around here and I've rotated some of them, but you can still see that they're ordered, right? And really, if you look at them hard, you can see exactly by which angle I rotated them, right? Um, so it's not like, you know, I can just keep generating these very different states that all look kind of the same. For the ordered states, all I can really do is rotate them and shift them around. Otherwise, they just look the same, okay? So this characteristic that for these more ordered states, you only have so many different ways to look at them, where for these disordered states, there's a lot of different ones that look the same in some sense of look, um, is how we're going to actually define something like disorder in a precise way. Okay, How do we make this concept precise, that these ordered states um, sort of all look the same, uh, all, all uh, that these disordered states all sort of look the same, while the ordered states, there's only a few ways to arrange them. Okay, and so I told you there's only be a limited number of equations here. Um, this is one of them. Um, so this is the gravestone of Ludwig Boltzmann. It was all over physics in the 1800s, um, but probably his most important contribution um, was this formula here um, for what's called the entropy. So that S there is entropy, K is called Boltzmann's constant, um, and log of W I will explain on the next slide. But I figured if we have an equation that one of the giants of 19th century physics thought was important enough to go on his gravestone, it was important enough that we could include it in the talk, okay? Uh, and so what we're gonna do is try to define what we mean by disorder by essentially changing the question. Um, instead of talking about disorder, we're gonna talk about this concept of entropy which captures this observation we just made on the previous slide. And so Boltzmann thought this was essential for explaining the world. So his sort of more poetic way of saying it, the general struggle for existence of animate beings is not a struggle for raw materials. These, these four organisms are air, water, and soil, all abundantly available, nor for energy, which exists in plenty in the sun and any hot body in the form of heat, but rather a struggle for entropy, which becomes available through the transition of energy from the hot sun to the cold earth. So he thought the world, life, everything was all about what entropy was doing, okay? Um, it's not the whole story, but it's a lot of the story. So um, it was an incredible, it is an incredibly important concept. So let's unpack what this formula means and then try to connect it to this more intuitive definition of disorder we had before. It's not gonna be identical, but we're gonna see it's gonna match this intuition um, we saw previously. So. What do we mean by entropy? So we're gonna find the entropy of something, so it's typically denoted by S, as being equal to some constant. So this K is called Boltzmann's constant. If, you're, if you want to, you can just completely ignore it. It really, it just sets units. It's like, you know, you have to measure your lengths in something, meters or feet or furlongs or whatever you measure it. That's all this is doing. It's setting some units. Its choice is somewhat conventional. So if you open a statistical mechanics textbook where this subject would come up, um, sometimes they just omit, omit this. So if you want to forget it, forget it. We have the natural logarithm, and then we have that logarithm acting on, so the logarithm of, the number of states consistent with a macroscopic description. So, so what do we mean by this? So entropy is what we're defining, logarithm, hopefully we all know what the logarithm is. What do we mean by number of states consistent with our macroscopic description? So let's start with what we mean by macroscopic description. So here we mean basically anything involving all the states of the atoms, atoms or of the system at once, right? And so things like the total energy, the total number of particles, the volume, the pressure, that total magnetization, the sum of all those magnetic moments, those are all macroscopic variables, right? They're things you could you know, see with your eyes, you can measure easily. They're not properties of a single atom at a single instant in time, okay? So those are what we call macroscopic properties. Um, and so what do we mean by consistent with that, right? We mean it's the number of underlying states of our system that have the right energy, that have the magnetization. Say we take out our, our magnetometer and we measure the magnetization of our magnet. We get it's some number, right? What we're asking is how many different ways can we arrange those underlying spins, those underlying magnetic moments 
to give that number. Okay, so that's what we mean by W. You take the logarithm of that, that's your entropy up to that constant. Okay, you might be asking, why do we have a logarithm there? Um, this is just because that number of states has become absurdly, absurdly large. The numbers are going to be too, too large to handle. Um, and so taking the logarithm will at least give us sort of reasonable numbers. There are fundamental reasons why the logarithm is a little bit better. It has to do with something called additivity of quantities, but we're not going to need to, to think about that here. Just in the back of your mind, think instead of dealing with a number with 19 zeros, if we take the log of a number with 19 zeros, we're going to have a number of order 19. Right. And so it takes big numbers or small numbers and makes them more manageable in size. OK. So let's think about what this means for the gas. So we kind of, you know, built our intuition on this. So let, let's try to translate this um, into this little picture of a, of a gas and a crystal that we have here. So the sort of simple macroscopic variable I'll use uh, will be something like the total energy. Right. And so we know when these things are just the right distance apart, they're gaining energy, their energy is lowered. Um, when they're too close together or too far apart, they're either costing a lot of energy or gaining no energy at all, right? And so you can imagine that these, if, the, if, the, if, our, if we knew that our system had a low energy, right? There'd only be a few states that it could be in, right? You know, if that's the, almost the minimum energy, you can only be in a state like this where it's formed these crystals. But if I raise the energy, right? then I can have atoms that are too close to each other or too far from each other. It doesn't have to have the minimum energy, right? And there are lots and lots of different ways to do this, and they look like these disordered states over here, right? And so these things have atoms that are too close together, atoms that are too far apart. Um, and if you constructed these carefully, um, you could actually have them so that each one of these states would have exactly the same energy um, uh, for all pairs of particles. For, for the, the, the sum of the energies for all pairs of particles would all be the same for each of these pictures. Okay, you'll have to imagine that because I did not construct them carefully enough for that to be true. Okay, and so this would be a state. But these, this would be a collection of states um, with the same energy, but there'd be lots of different ones, right? So that entropy would be larger. Here we have, for lower energies, we'd have a collection of states that's smaller, your entropy would be lower. Okay. Trying to count number of states becomes a little fuzzy when you're dealing with particles like this. So let me um, try to make this a little sharper by talking about something where it's just a le little easier to count, a little easier to look at rather than looking at these, these sort of continuous variables. Um, and so a simple example is systems where each atom can only be really be in two different states. Um, and so here I've sort of represented this little model as each atom as being a square and it's two states as being either a black square or a white square, right? You could think of these as if it's a magnet, these could be the orientation of a spin, one's up and one's down. This could be something like an alloy. If it's a chemical problem, black could be one element, white could be a different element, All right? There's lots of different problems that can map onto this. Um, but the nice thing is if we wanna count or think about how many different ways to do something there are, then at least we're just counting discrete things rather than continuous things, okay? And so I'll use this kind of magnetic language and think of these as being spins. And the question I'm going to ask is, what is the entropy if we know not the energy of the system, but say the total magnetization, right? And so by that, I mean, if I add up all of these, these variables, say plus one for these black squares, minus one for these white squares, if I say that's fixed, how many states do I have that are compatible with that? Okay, and so here's an example um, for a state that has total magnetization of zero, there's an equal number of white squares and equal number of black squares. Okay, so for a small number of these squares, it's easier to, to just draw all of them. So here, this is, would be sort of four atoms. One, each can be in each one of these two states. Um, I've done all 16 possibilities here. Um, and so say we're talking about like in that picture before states where the total magnetization was zero, then we'd be looking at states Consistent with states consistent with that description would be these six here, where we have equal number of black and equal number of white squares, right? And so one thing I want you to see is that there are more of them than the other types, okay? There are six of these uh, m equal to zero states, only four of the next one up and only one of the next one up, okay? And so this is something that actually grows this discrepancy that these states where this m is zero actually gets worse and worse as you go up you go to, to, to a bigger thing, 
there are actually more and more and more of these states that have total magnetization zero, right? And so just like we saw those, you know, random looking configurations of particles as looking disorder, hopefully you can also see that these pictures here should set off that, that definite, or at least intuitive definition that these things are at least somewhat disordered. Okay. And so I won't present you the, the actual combinatorics to do it, but it's, it's actually not too bad, but I'll, I'll just tell you the, the answer here. If you tried to count how many of these are, how many states there are, um, say with zero magnetization, you would get a huge number of them, roughly two to the power of the number of different spins you have. And so this is a number that grows very, very fast. So if you had 16, you'd have 65,000 different states, 32 of them, 4 billion, 64. I don't know what, the, what they call that number, but it has 19 digits, right? And so now you can see why this log is kind of nice, right? And so if here you can encapsulate this a little more nicely as this entropy is proportional to the number of particles and the proportionality is just log two, right? And so these numbers never get completely out of hand, right? And so for a system like this, the one of this, this animation I'm showing you um, is 64 by 64, it's a grid. So there's about 4,000 spins in there. This number would be unimaginably large, right? And so this little video I'm showing that's randomly generating these states there's so many of them that it's entirely unlikely if we kept running this, you know, for the rest of our of our natural lives, we would never see the same state twice. Right. So very, very large numbers that show up here. So these m equal to zero states look quite disordered, right? There's they have a high entropy. Um, there's lots of them that are consistent with this statement that the magnetization is zero. We can see the opposite behavior, more ordered states, if instead of looking at zero magnetization, we ask what happens if the magnetization is as big or as small as possible, okay? So this means say all of the spins are plus one in the up direction or all of them are minus one in the down direction, okay? So in that case, if they're all plus one, magnetization is equal to the number of these spins. There's only one way to do that, right? If they're all in the opposite direction, there's only one way to do that, right? If I say, well, what's the entropy if them being completely polarized, either all up or all down, have the maximum possible magnetization, that's all I know, just be log two, right? So doesn't, not proportional to the number of these spins, right? And if you look at this picture here, if you say, well, let's say I'm not exactly on that biggest possible magnetization, what does that entropy look like? Well, hopefully you can see that if it's not all up, there's little, you know, down spins floating around in there, there's clearly a lot less ways to do that than there was when the magnetization was zero, right? The variety of these things um, does not look nearly as rich as this one here, okay? So as you make this magnetization larger and larger, approaching its maximum value, the entropy shrinks, right? And so this quantity is behaving a lot like our intuition for disorder, right? The definition is not disorder, right? We didn't have a good definition for disorder. Right, but it's satisfying all of our normal intuition about the sort of, right? That when we have lots of states that look the same, the entropy is high. When we only have a few, uh, the entropy is low. Okay, so why do we care about entropy, right? I, you know, you can't just say, well, let's bring in the word disorder and then swap it for entropy and then just talk about entropy. So what, why is it entropy a better thing to talk about? Um, and this is because it, in statistical physics, so, most science students are only going to get a, a taste of statistical physics. Even physics students don't get it until their third or fourth year in any real sense. Um, is that all else being equal, um, uh, a system is most likely to be found in accessible states that maximize its entropy. Okay. So accessible here means consistent with our macroscopic description, having that known energy, having that known magnetization, um, like we used in its definition. Okay. So this quantity actually sort of determines a lot of the statistical behavior of complex systems out in the world, okay? And for, for those of you who, who don't, you know, you see the word statistical and physics in the same sentence together and you shut off, right? Um, at least for the chemists, I'm not sure this will make you shut off more or less, but this is the kind of thing where you can derive all of thermodynamics from. Right? This kind of principle underlies all of thermal, all of uh, thermal physics, all of thermodynamics. Um, and so at the very least, even if one doesn't like it, it is important, right? 
And so you can kind of roughly understand this by a kind of principle of ignorance. Um, this is actually usually how it's, how it's derived in statistical physics, um, which is you basically say, well, if I don't know, if I know I have all these states which are consistent with what I know about my system, they're all in principle possible, I might as well just be as ignorant as possible and assumed all of those states are equally likely. Seems reasonable if you don't know anything else. Um, and so because of that, you're more likely to end up in the high entropy parts, just if only because there are more high entropy states, right? So if one goes through the statistical physics, you can actually sharpen this a bit, and I won't get into it because I promised not too many equations here, um, but uh, at least at fixed temperature, uh, which you know a lot of what we do out in the world is at fixed temperature. Um, there's actually there's a competition between entropy and energy. So systems all else being equal want to maximize their entropy. Um, here, what we find is for at low temperatures, um, uh, the system wants to minimize its energy. It doesn't care so much about entropy. For at high temperatures, it wants to do the opposite. It doesn't care so much about energy. It wants to maximize its entropy. Okay, and so as you go from hot to cold, as you change the temperature, you're really tuning a competition between energy and entropy. Okay, entropy favoring um, states which all look which have the same macroscopic properties. But um, sorry, let me say this. I want to say this correctly. Um, entropy favoring the system um, going into states where there are sort of lots of copies that all sort of look the same, where um, at low temperature, you're going into states where the energy, energy is minimized. There's only a few of those, right? So you're sort of tuning from order at low temperatures to disorder at high temperatures, right? And so this competition between energy and entropy is what drives a lot of thermal physics, right? You know, these ordered states like crystals are solids, disordered states, like you can see there, things like liquids and gases, right? And so as you go, as you raise or cool the temperature, you go between these things. Okay, so that was the whirlwind tour of order, disorder, and entropy. Um, really, we've sort of, we should probably dispense with that word disorder since I think it doesn't capture um, everything entropy captures. And so let's ask this last question a little differently. If at low temperatures, um, if at low temperatures, the system just wants to minimize its energy, it doesn't care about the entropy, how can entropy lead to ordering? Okay. And so I'm gonna give you the answer at the top and then I'm going to try to explain to you, uh, work through an example, which um, is sort of near and dear to me of, of a physical system where this happens and try to explain to you the general principles um, and then hopefully show you if I don't run out of time, um, some experimental data um, that supports uh, uh, this effect. Okay, so let's start with the answer. How can entropy lead to order? So the answer is simple. Well, at low temperatures, it wants to minimize the energy. But if you have a bunch of different states with all the same energy, then what is it to do? Right? If they're all, if there's a bunch of different minima and they're all the same energy, what what does it go to next? Right? And the answer is. Well, there's still the entropy to worry about. We still want to maximize the entropy. So if they're all the same with respect to energy, how do we distinguish them? We pick the one that, that gives you the highest entropy. Okay. So this is what is called order by disorder. Okay. So let me run you through an example for this. Um, I'm going to throw a whole bunch of crap at you in the next slide or two. Don't be bothered by it too much um, because the underlying picture is actually relatively simple, I think. Um, but I'm going to show you some complicated crystal lattices and some complicated magnetic arrows whirling about, but just try to focus, for, try not to get too distracted by it. Okay, so one of the best material examples for this physics is a magnetic system called erbium titanate. So the chemical formula is here. Um, it's relatively complicated with the titaniums and the oxygens, but the only thing we're going to have to care about is this erbium. Um, so in this crystal, this erbiums are, these erbiums are arranged in a three-dimensional crystal structure, um, which I've illustrated here, where, they're, where they form tetrahedra, 
that are joined together at their corners. And so this forms a regular network, um, a three-dimensional crystal. Um, so this is called the pyrochlor, pyrochlor lattice. And this erbium ion, which in this case will be of uh, trivalent, three plus, um, is magnetic. It has unpaired electrons. These unpaired electrons give this erbium atom a magnetic moment. Okay, and so I've sort of drawn a picture of a, of a single erbium here, and I've drawn an arrow just to indicate it has some magnetic moment. So on this thing, the atomic physics is a little complicated. If you go back to Hund's rules and the you know physics of spin orbit coupling and all these things, you know there's ten slides I could do just about that. Um, but the upshot is a uh, upshot of it is um, the combination of the spin of the electrons and the orbital mag orbital magnetic moment of the electrons um, contributes to some bar magnet like object. Um, some spin-like object that lives at each one of these sites. Okay. So these things talk to each other, just like in the ferromagnet. You know, you might imagine, do they have some tendency to align? Do they have some tendency to anti-align? Right. What do they want to do relative to their neighbors? Um, here, it ends up being quite complicated. So I'm not even going to try to describe that in any real detail. What I'll just tell you is the minimum energy state you get out of it is not unique. Okay. So they don't actually want to anti-align or a line, they want to do something in between. Um, and what they want to do, I've illustrated here. So this is one of these tetrahedra, and I've drawn these magnetic moments on here, and you can see they're spinning around. And so if we were to pause that at any point in time, and I don't think I can without stopping the slideshow, um, that would be a minimum energy configuration, okay? So no matter what angle I do, as so long as I rotate all these things together, I have found the minimum energy. It does not change, okay? So this is what I mean when I say energy can't distinguish these. Energy doesn't know which one to pick, okay? So I can keep rotating these um, throughout any angle. So long as I do it in this way, I'm showing this, this animation um, and nothing changes. Uh, you might worry a little bit about, that's just one tetrahedron. You want the whole lattice, it looks something like this. Um, so you just replicate this tetrahedron um, over and over again. And still this minimum energy state is still this minimum energy state. Okay, so then, so then what happens, right? What happens when energy is not enough? So we have a system where there are many of these states with the same energy, okay? And I've sort of indicated that schematically here. I'm sorry for going from my, you know, ray traced 3D things to my crude hand-drawn illustrations, but at least we'll get some contrast. Um, uh, I've illustrated here, um, sort of the energy landscape in this system. Basically, I put energy on the vertical axis, and then in these two axes here, I put sort of the direction of these moments. I've sort of forgotten about most of the details here, but you can imagine as this thing rotates around, it's tracing out some angle, right? And that's what this angle is here. And so the minimum will sit at the bottom of this um, sort of sombrero-like potential. Um, and the bottom of it, this red line, they all have exactly the same energy, independent of what that angle is. Right, And so by energy, you ask which state it picks, and the answer is it doesn't pick any. They all have the same energy. Okay, and So now we have to go to the next thing, which is, well, if the energy is the same, let's then maximize the entropy. Okay, So even though the energy is the same for these states, the entropy doesn't have to be. Okay, And so hopefully this drawing is somewhat clear. This minimum here is perfectly flat. This circle is perfectly flat. But this landscape of the energy as I go away from that minimum doesn't have to be the same at every angle. And so if I say I zoom in here, here's my minimum perfectly flat. The curvature of this, how steep this sort of valley is, can change as I go around, right? So in one place, it can be flatter. In another place, it can be steeper, right? And so what does this mean for entropy, right? You know, if I'm looking at the minimum energy, okay, well, yeah. That's fine. There's just those states there that are at the minimum energy. But if I have a little bit more energy than that, I'm not just looking at those states. I'm looking at the states that go up these walls a bit, right? And if these walls are flatter, then that means if I go up a little bit in energy, there are more states for the flat parts than there are for the steeper parts. More states means more entropy, OK? And so loosely, as you go around this circle, change this angle, there are places where there are more states, and there are places where there are fewer states. Okay, and so the places where there are more states means higher entropy, 
fewer states means lower entropy, okay? And so from our general principle, energy the same, that doesn't matter. You pick the states where the entropy is higher, okay? So this state would be preferred over this one here, and this actually resolves the issue. So rather than just having any angle at all to be picked, you, can, you will pick the ones where the entropy is highest, okay? This is the fundamental picture, the whole story of order by disorder. Basically, once we eliminate the competition in energy, entropy takes over. And even if things are the same in energy, they do not have to be the same in entropy, okay? So what happened? Without entropy, we didn't have any order. It didn't know which one to pick. There was no preferred state. With entropy, it knew which one to pick. Um, we had a preferred state, okay? So this concept, uh, originally called order as an effective disorder, um, was first uh, sort of elucidated about 40 years ago by this guy, Jacques Vallin. Um, we did a lot of important work in frustrated magnetism and unfortunately uh, passed away uh, just a few months ago. Um, but this famous paper of his here laid out basically all of this in a very different context, in a very different language. And I don't just mean the French here, um, but in a, just a very different set of uh, physical situations. Um, and one thing that was realized almost immediately after they put forth this idea is that it's not this order by disorder phenomenon that once energy is ruled out because they're all equal, um, it's not just entropy that can take over, right? Once you flatten out one big part of the problem, you remove one big part of the problem out of the equation, you make that energy the same, other kinds of fluctuation effects can take over. And so you can think of this thermal disorder, this entropy, as the system fluctuating around in these states that are nearby, right? You can think of other ways the system might fluctuate and thus come up with other kinds of order by disorder. And so pretty much any kinds of fluctuations can serve this same purpose. And in the intervening four decades, people have pretty much written down all the different ways order by something disorder. They filled that in with all possible words that they've been able to think of. Um, and so one important example of it is what's called order by quantum disorder. Okay, so here we had um, maximization of entropy picking out um, which state we're talking about. But if any fluctuations work, you know, what about the system being a little bit quantum mechanical? Okay, and so I, I can't really teach you too much quantum mechanics here, but order by thermal disorder, this entropy, you need some finite temperature, right? You can't, if you're at zero temperature, you're in that ground state, you're right on that minimum, that the curvature of those valleys doesn't matter, this effect doesn't happen. But at zero temperature, once quantum mechanics comes in, you can have fluctuations through quantum effects, right? And so one famous way to see this is, is what's called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So this word uncertainty is a bit of a misnomer, really. It's about fluctuations. Um, so it basically says, if you have a, a, a position X and a momentum P um, in quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, those two things can be perfectly well-defined. Um, in quantum mechanics, there's a restriction, which is these things become random variables that are fluctuating. This says that the, the amount X is the position is fluctuating times the amount the momentum is fluctuating has to be greater than or equal to something, right? Some new fundamental constant, this Planck's constant divided by two, okay? And so what does this say? Well, it says that this product of these fluctuations can't be zero. It has to be greater than something, right? Which means both of these have to be finite, right? So in quantum mechanics, these variables have to be fluctuating even at zero temperature, right? And so these fluctuations can give rise to the same kind of physics that the entropy was giving, right? Here, we're, I can't, again, I can't teach you quantum mechanics in the next nine minutes, um, but uh, essentially the same kind of um, result comes out. For the, the order by thermal disorder, it picked the state with the highest entropy, the one that could fluctuate the most, there are the most states surrounded. And quantum mechanics does exactly the same thing. It picks the state that has the most quantum fluctuations, okay? And so this has actually been the most promising place to try to realize this um, in actual material systems. So the thermal part has, is a, the, the, the thermal effect um, does, is realized in, in, in experimental systems, but it's a lot harder to detect. Um, and it's a lot harder to disentangle from other kinds of, of physics. This quantum effect um, is a little cleaner since it happens at zero temperature. 
And so how do people try to detect this? Um, so I'm going to go a little too fast here, but I'm running out of time. So I apologize. Uh, I, hopefully, I'll just give you a flavor um, uh, for what we're saying here. Um, so how do you detect it? Um, so usually what they do is they look at um, the excitations of the system. Basically, they poke the system, usually with a, an x-ray or a neutron, um, and do they see um, at what energy um, does the system respond most, most with, right? Um, respond most strongly with, right? And so without fluctuations, you have these states, I've sort of illustrated as a cartoon here, that have the same energy. And without those fluctuations, I can change them and find another state here, just rotate it a little bit, um, that have exactly the same energy. So taking these here, rotating them a little bit, that didn't cost me anything, right? It's like moving around at the bottom of that sombrero, okay? And so if I can go from something uniform to something tilted like this for zero energy cost, then it should feel plausible that if I deform this thing a little bit, don't do a uniform rotation, but one that changes in space, over a long length scale, then that should cost a small amount of energy, right? You can think of a, if, if I'm changing this with some sort of periodicity, with some sort of wavelength I'm calling lambda, if that lambda was infinity, it's just doing this rotation that costs no energy. If this lambda is finite, it should cost some energy, but then as the wavelength gets longer and longer and longer, that energy cost should go away, okay? So this was called the Goldstone mode. It's a sort of general consequence of having these kind of transformations where you have no cost to sort of smoothly change your variables, okay? So these things can in principle be detected. And so usually what they do is they shoot this thing with neutrons or x-rays. Um, they vary the wavelength of the neutron. Um, uh, sorry, they, they shoot in the neutron and they detect how much the wavelength of the neutron changes coming out. Um, and from that, they can resolve um, essentially how much energy it costs to sort of do these twists in the system at a given wavelength, okay? And so I put that wavelength here, really one over it, um, and I put that energy cost here, okay? So typically in these systems, if you didn't have fluctuations, this relationship would look like this. As that wavelength uh, went to infinity, so one over it goes to zero, the energy cost would also go to zero, okay? So that means here I'm just twisting them all uniformly, here I'm twisting them, but on a longer and longer length scale, shorter and shorter as I go out. Now, if we add fluctuations, we know it has a preference. It prefers the state with more quantum fluctuations, with more entropy, all of these things, right? And so we know that even if I made this thing a rotation of the, the spins at overall the whole system, it's still gonna cost energy, right? And so this point steer here, instead of the energy cost being zero, this now becomes finite, okay? And so this is the signature that they look for in these experiments. Basically, when they shoot it with neutrons or x-rays, they see a response. Um, or they, they're looking for a curve like this, where you have this excitation um, near very long wavelength, where there's a finite energy cost, and usually that energy cost is quite small. Okay. So in this erbium titanate system, they've done this measurement. So this was done uh, 2014, uh, eight years ago now. I always have to check how many years ago things were. Um, and so I've abstracted away most of the details here, but this, uh, this is one over the wavelength of that excitation. This is that energy cost. Um, here you can see the intensity is tracing out a curve that looks something like this. And you can see, it's, if you look at it very carefully, you can see that it's bottoming, bottoming out at some finite value, somewhere around here. It's not going all the way to zero. Um, this was done by several groups. A second group did the exact same experiment. Their data is just a little bit better. You can see the same kind of curve, right? There's some kind of response because of this selection effect from, from quantum fluctuations or from entropy, you end up with this thing having a finite energy cost, okay? You can go ahead and see if this matches what we expect. So I'm a theoretical physicist. So what I try to do is calculate is that number, how big is that gap? How big, it, how big should it be from, from the quantum fluctuations? Um, this is something we tried to do a few years ago. We were able to derive, I apologize for putting a second formula in, but I wasn't sure I was actually gonna get this far. Um, uh, we derived a formula for working out what this gap is. Um, 
I won't get into the details of it, but it basically involves um, treating uh, this landscape, uh, this sort of sombrero type uh, picture, treating it kind of like a, a classical, like a spring, um, but calculating the spring constant um, based on the value of the entropy or the value of this, uh, the strength of these quantum fluctuations. Um, so we were able to prove uh, a formula for actually computing this gap uh, somewhat directly. Um, this formula actually, uh, we proved it about four years ago for the quantum case. Um, and recently we actually proved it uh, just in the last few months uh, for this thermal case as well. And so from that, we were actually able to calculate this gap, use what we know about this material and how these, how we know their spins interact and try to see how well this worked. Uh, and the answer is not terrible. <laughs> so experimentally, you get a number something like this. Um, this is uh, 0 0.04 to 0 0.05 mil electron volts or 40 to 50 micro electron volts. That's the experimental value, depending on which experimental group you like better. Um, if you put in the theory, you get about 32, 31. So it's about the right order of magnitude. So this gives you, you know, a strong suggestion that we're onto the right amount of physics, the right physics here. Um, but quantitatively, we could do better. It's off by something like 30 to 50 percent, depending again on which group, um, which group you believe. Um, and so this can be improved, and this is something that's being worked on. Um, really, we need to model this material a little better. Um, and as you can see from those experiments, they looked quite noisy. So the experiment um, has to be done a little better as well. Um, this is work that is ongoing. So actually, this is uh, there's ongoing experimental and theoretical work to try to improve both of these numbers, um, get a better number for this uh, experimental value, and then get a better number for this by modeling um, the material itself um, more precisely. Um, that's still ongoing, so I can't tell you the result of that just yet. Um, but you know, this kind of agreement is already pretty good, and it's not unreasonable that this gap, this this difference, could be closed. Um, without too much effort. So this material, right, complicated it is, as it is, is showing, you know, about as good as we've got evidence for this kind of order by disorder phenomenon, that um, the state that's being picked in this material, the direction of its, of, the, of its spins is not determined, even at very low temperature, is not determined by its energy um, directly, but is actually determined by these quantum fluctuations. Okay, I'm basically out of time, so I'm going to stop there. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you order and disorder are somewhat fundamental in physics, um, maybe not just in physics, but in, in, in science in general. Um, and that long range order, this, these regular structured patterns can characterize many uh, different phases of matter. Uh, hopefully you take away at least part of the, uh, what the definition of entropy is, um, which is it basically counts the number of states that are compatible with known macroscopic properties. So. It's something like disorder. It is not exactly disorder. So um, try to keep those two concepts a little bit separate in your head. Um, and then at finite, at finite temperature, entropy and energy compete. Basically, at low temperatures, you want to minimize the energy. At high temperatures, you want to maximize the entropy. In between, you want to do some combination. Um, if you take a thermodynamics or a uh, physical physics course, um, you'll see at all temperatures, what you want to minimize is the, the free energy, which is a combination of these two but I didn't want to get into that level of detail with you. Um, there's lots of interesting questions here. We need to, as you saw from that, some lack of perfect agreement between these, these numbers. Um, there is better understanding needed of the different forms of order by disorder that appear in real materials. So we need more examples, we need better examples. We need to understand these examples better. Um, and there are also sort of corner cases that we haven't talked about uh, that I mentioned briefly, such as frustration. Um, so these are low energy states with high entropy. Right, so lots and lots of states, um, same macroscopic properties, all at the minimum energy or at low energy, but there's just lots and lots of them. And so what happens when we include fluctuations on top of that? So usually the more states you have, the more interesting it gets. And so the kind of behavior you can get out of that ends up being a lot richer. And this is actually one of the, uh, the my sort of main uh, research interests is what happens in frustrated materials what happens when you have highly frustrated systems, and then you include these kinds of fluctuations. Um, and as we saw, this is kind of the sort of baby version of it, right? You know, here, there's a few states, right? We had that one manifold, that one angle that we didn't know how to pick based on energy. But you can imagine more complicated systems where instead of just having one angle, you have many, many angles, many, many variables that aren't fixed by the energy, where you have minima um, 
that grow exponentially in the number of particles, right? And so this is sort of the simplest, the, the, the kernel of frustration is in these order by disorder systems, but it's really just the beginning. Okay, uh, if you wanna learn anything more about my work, I put my website up there. Um, you can, uh, basically it's just a list of publications, but um, uh, it also has uh, a brief description of, of, of some of the stuff I do. And uh, let me stop there and thank you for your attention. Awesome. At this point, uh, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to uh, give a presentation. Um, I don't know if you have a few minutes maybe for uh, some questions. I'll yeah. let people type in the chat. Um, maybe just to, to fill the air here, I'll ask a question. Um, so uh, on that slide with the quantum fluctuations, uh, you were kind of showing that there's those two variables there that are fluctuating. Um, it, it, does it depend on the system, which one it tries to maximize, or is it trying to do some balance between the two? Yeah, so it, it depends on uh, states as well. So you can construct, in quantum mechanics, you can construct states that have very low fluctuations in position, but then correspondingly have a high fluctuation momentum, right? And so which, what happens in those states will depend on you know, what the actual initial conditions are for that physical system is also the system itself. So for example, in, in, if you have something like a, a linear spring, a harmonic oscillator, um, it can actually um, uh, saturate this equality where essentially it reaches that sort of um, place where that, that's not greater than, but it's actually equal to. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this depends on the initial conditions.